Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. And thank you for the presentation. Um, I think you're going to help me, right? <laughs> it was really hard. I was saying it was really hard to wake up this morning. There's too many parties, you know, and, uh, but I was really good. I still have my voice, and um, it's an honor for me. I'm the guest of honor, but it's an honor for me to be here. Um, yesterday, there was a presentation here with uh, press, and um, I introduced, actually, um, you know, a little bit of the concept of, you know, what is it that there is in the entrance hall here. I will not talk about that today here. Uh, we'll show you more what it's inspired me. Tienes que empezar desde el principio. Yeah. You know, so I will, I will show you a little bit what it's inspired me, and uh, obviously, oh, sorry about that. One second. We have a little bit of a technical issue. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's the presentation. So I was, I was, you know, I was explaining yesterday what was, in, you know, relevant in the, um, in the entrance hall. And if you go to the, um, to the exhibition, what it's important to me is that I just left a little bit of my brain within that installation, which is that it's sort of trying to show you without knowing me what is important to me in terms of inspiration. That's why you have a little bit of a journey, which is small, but you see a lot of objects and things. The good thing of being here today is that I will cross through a lot of the images and a lot of the items that I've done, trying to explain you a little bit of it. And at the same time, the good thing is like you can experience some of the objects and some of the sculptures and some of the elements that are there. Anyway, this is me. <laughs> and that's my name, um, Hayon. <laughs> And uh, this is where I live. I live in Valencia, in the Mediterranean. And uh, in general, I'm, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> you know, I'm not a sad guy at all. <laughs> I'm a happy guy. So, uh, because we have the sea and the sun and, you know, and the food and all these kind of things. It makes it really happy. So, so I think that's actually, at the end, what makes my design quite, um, you know, quite a reflection of my life. Yeah? So anyway, we're going to cross through a lot of images. This is what I do. I do artworks um, and installations. That's how I started my career. I do product design. I do interior design and also experiments, like the house. It's an experiment. I could have made a white box, but I didn't. I had to do an architecture that was bizarre because I used the uh, opportunities like that to make things, to experiment with it. So when I created uh, the first uh, works in my career, the first thing I think I did was that I tried to, to try things and see what happened. First works were non-functional. I was not a designer. I was just an artist trying to put up some sculptures. And I did a lot of things. I did a lot of experiments with ceramics. Um, everyone that was asking me to do something back then uh, was asking me to do you know, little things, and, uh, but I thought little things, you don't see them so much, so I made bigger things. And, um, and I showed them in galleries, and uh, nobody bought anything. <laughs> you know, uh, for my surprise, it was not so easy. Uh, actually, this is really fun. Uh, one of these vases, these were handmade vases uh, about 12 years ago, and I brought them to a gallery of a friend of mine in Barcelona, and he always, uh, the, his response every day was like, oh, we didn't sell anything. You know, <laughs> every day, <laughs> like that. And, and then I, they always were back at home, you know. So I always had a lot of the stuff I made <laughs> that I didn't sell at home. Um, you know, funny thing, now it's part of some museums and stuff. But at the beginning, it's really hard to believe in yourself, I guess. Because if nobody buys it, well, then what do you do? So I think something that um, I've learned through the years, instead of trying to get a little bit of autoesteem, you know, through the works you're doing. And obviously, I started in the design platform, but I was not making furniture for Fritz Hansen. I was making planes with, like, mosaic or, like, uh, you know, a strange uh, installation such as this one that I made in London, uh, which is um, actually a chess game in the middle of Trafalgar Square, um, which was based on this idea of the invasion of, um, of the English uh, and the Spanish having a battle, you know, in... in uh, in the old times, so I, I had the opportunity to make this, uh, this beautiful chess game, which was completely handmade in ceramics in the middle of one of the most important squares in London. Obviously, these are not chronological, so I didn't go from selling nothing to being in Trafalgar Square. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so this is not chronological. This is just to tell you where my aesthetical world starts, and it starts by experiencing materials and objects in not in the context of design, but in the context of art galleries and spaces that were allowing me to be free, yeah? Uh, this is a really funny one. Um, 
on the left is the sketch I presented to the sponsor of this installation. It's the worst sketch in the planet I've ever done. Um, it's terrible because this was an installation that the electricity company of Italy called Enel sponsored. And um, I went there and there were all these bosses from the energy company. <laughs> and I showed them this really crappy sketch, <laughs> you know, like terrible one, which is like a circuit. You know, it's like, I'm going to make a circuit for you as an innovation. You know, and they looked at me going like, whoa, whatever. But then the circuit is actually what happened. Because what you see there is this sort of like, well, there were these vases that were moving and they were provoking energy and the whole house was breathing, you know, and at the end they were communicating through this table that had solar cells into this cabinet that had propellers that were moving and everything was activating as a circuit. So at the end, it was a circuit, but not the typical one. <laughs> but obviously those businessmen were quite freaked out with me. You know, anyway. This is a good story, and uh, like these ones, I had a lot of them. I've always thought that furniture is talking to you, and you will say, he's crazy, because you know, he doesn't have a mouth and uh, all these kind of things. But I do see a lot of mouths, actually, in everything I see, and eyes and, <laughs> and faces, and, and I think the furniture is actually talking to you, like, believe it or not, it is. It's communicating, you know? And I think that's actually the change. The change of the 21st century is that we're not only doing functional stuff, we're also doing things that talk, you know? Which means that if you see something, it's actually, yeah, obviously if it's a chair, it needs to be not like this one, because, you know, you don't want to do this with, um, with Fritz Hansen, for example. <laughs> Again, <laughs> you know, they'll, <laughs> they'll kill you, <laughs> you know? But, um, but I could do this in a gallery, you know, this kind of experiencing and trying to make concepts that we're talking about a theme. Here the theme was, uh, I call it American Chateau which was an, an, you know, an installation in London. And I played with American um, banal things, such as limousines and stuff like that, to make tables and you know, things. I've always experienced with furniture in a different way. You know, I didn't just accept to make just a functional object because I wasn't not trained for that. I was trained to make experiments. And um, then the serious thing came, which is that by making the, you know, by making all these things that I showed you, yeah, the editors started to call me. So the first one was um, a company called BD Barcelona, which actually uh, makes, well, they were editing Gaudí's work and Dali's work. So they were in between art and design that asked me to make pieces. This actually was my first design piece. And it was a total accident because it was like about 13 years ago. And they didn't ask me to make a product. They asked me to make something with my sculptures. And I made a bathroom because they were a bathroom company. Um, and then I, I, I got a lot of interest from people that were telling me, hey man, your bathroom is different, you know? I mean, it's kind of like, what is it? You know, it has good, nice, nice proportions. And, and it ended up being ex an experience of an exhibition, but it ended up being a product, you know, suddenly. And this is how I entered the industrial design product. You know, imagine how weird. You go from completely from the other door, nothing that, I, you know, I never went to a company and show a sketch to do something. Uh, no, it, it was always making things. Uh, through conversations and, and because it was an installation or there was a sort of a conversation like that. Obviously that changed and in the years I've been creating a lot of furniture which today you can see obviously. Um, also in parallel I continue to do these installations that I'm doing but the most important is that the design work from the beginning was not just a response of a brief but it was more trying to make always a statement through the products. That's why I'm saying the products are communicating to you. You know, this was, this company asked me to make a minimal cabinet, imagine. And I said, yeah, it will be minimal if the client choose the Japanese tea on the block. But if you don't want a minimal, you just choose your leg, yeah? And this, I didn't even design the legs. I just asked everyone that I knew, my brother, my father, you know, a friend that I had in the bakery, just send me whatever leg you have in your house. And I send them to the company and they had a cabinet, yeah? So, Design can be actually an accidental, you know? It's not, it's not always something you think. It's also something you sort of elaborate, creating a concept, yeah? Now, when I make a chair, it's to seed, though. You know, it's not like a sausage that I, like the one I saw, <laughs> I saw you before. That's for an exhibition. So I consider myself an artist and a designer at the same time. You know, I'm someone that thinks that um, you can live in both worlds. I don't think I'm, you know, I never believed in categories. And the question almost everyone is always asking me is like, are you a designer or are you an artist or, 
or are you more an artist or are you more a designer? It's like, why do we have to choose everything? You know, we're living in this sort of hybrid world in which you can be anything you want. So I'm actually Jaime, <laughs> which is really easy. <laughs> you know, it's actually, I'm a creative and that's it. You know, so I don't really choose. You know, today you can design a very nicely a sofa like this one. And at the same time, you can do a rocking hot dog. <laughs> you, know, you can, because there are two contexts. And anyway, in one and the other, you see the trace of your style. When I started Fritz Hansen, it was very serious. Um, Scandinavian company, we're here in Sweden, we're not in Sevilla. Yeah? And uh, for me, it was like, you know, why are they calling me? You know, I, I know about uh, Jamon Serrano and you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, flamenco. I can, I can sing, actually, if you want, later. <laughs> but um, you know, they actually asked me to do a furniture. <laughs> So the first thing I, I did, it was that really respectfully, I just went to the factory and I saw that Arne Jacobsen had made very interesting sculptural pieces and very interesting upholstery pieces. And then I, I understood that there was, there was something in the DNA that wasn't thought really much by uh, other designers that had been there before, which I really actually admired. But there was something in the grain, in my opinion, that was not taken in consideration, which is like, what are they good at? So then I thought very simply, I'm going to think about a piece that they can make really well, better than anyone, which was this one. And what I did is like, took attention to detail, took attention to color, thought about that these pieces are upholstered and then they have a touch of metal that touched the ground. So I thought about every single element. At the same side, this was a profound design exercise, but in parallel, I was still thinking that pieces could tell you something. You know, this lamp, for example, is inspired on sticks, you know? Or this one, it's really funny because it's like, I call it America, and it's basically a lamp that is, for me, it's like a boat. It's kind of, kind of living by, you know? <laughs> it's like going to America, you know? It's like a boat. <laughs> so, that's what I'm telling you. The things talk to you. But not only it's interesting for me to make a theme, sometimes I'm also someone that is a little bit scientific. I like the idea of researching and getting into materials. This is interesting. This is a chair made of rattan. You know, the rattan is a typical material. Uh, you know, you see it everywhere in my countries all over, especially in Mallorca and the Mediterranean. We use it a lot. But it's, it's a good material. It's natural, beautiful, light, but it's actually, you know, you have the threads and all that. It makes it old, yeah? So what I try is to make a chair that doesn't have any, any thread on it. So I made a new system of how to assemble it. So it's sort of a new rattan wood. You know, suddenly it has something that it makes it very modern. So it's just a little grain of thinking to get somewhere else. Same happened to this chair that you have also in the exhibition. Here is like, you can see easily how my brain thinks. I think about an image, I think about an object. This is an arpa, uh, the instrument, and then the chair. I call it the arpa chair because it's inspired directly through that form. Um, it's very beautiful to go around and look at the world thinking that anything could be a response to creativity. And I think that's really interesting when you're passionate about how things are constructed, but you're also passionate about what things mean, then you get somewhere, you know? You see penguins and you say, oh, how cute. I see penguins and I go, nice, let's make a chair for and tradition, which is like a penguin embracing the other, you know? And I see this guy and I'm thinking, yeah, this chair, you know, this is what I'm telling you, this chair is in the fair, you know, you can go to and tradition, but it's not, you will not see it anymore as a chair. Like, today you see where it comes from. For you, you know now that it's embracing you. It's telling you, I'm here, you know? This is the chair, <laughs> you know? It's like a person going like that. So, this is exactly the point that I'm talking about. It's like, these pieces can be functional. We know that design has to be comfortable. We know that design needs to be ecological, blah, 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 yeah? But at the same time, it can speak to you. That's why it has the face and the arms, you know? But obviously, it needs to be good. It needs to be good because you cannot make a crap, yeah? This is the beginning of the raw chair. I said, let's do a chair that is beautiful from behind and is actually feeling like the column. So the form that this chair has comes from my passion to sculpture, so Henry Moore and, you know, how the light goes into the piece and all this stuff, but at the same time, it's this piece that you want to see from behind and it reminds you to the human being. It's sort of like, you know, like your neck and your back, you know, it's sort of, it's there, yeah? So I think what is important in the design when you do it, it's obviously to understand who do you have in front, but at the same time, it's also important to, 
to feel that the design is not only a function, but it's also something that can really give a certain type of perception to the customer, to the person that is using it. Um, this was really funny. We added the low version of this chair. And this is because when I sit it in the raw chair, I, I feel private. And then I said, if I'm in a bar and I need to order a beer, I don't see anything. <laughs> you know, because I'm covered, yeah? So then low version is like, easy to go and say, hey, can you pass me a beer? Yeah? So this is exactly why I did the low version, because it's free, you know? And that's why it's called free, actually. Because you see 360 degrees, you can see anywhere, you know, you have uh, an active uh, position. So it's really different. And it's not to think about a brief, it's to think about what does it mean, what the chair means, what does it want to say to you, yeah? So obviously, with all this amount of work, then people came to me and said, can you do interiors for us? Then I started to make some interiors. This one was 12 years ago. It was a restaurant in Madrid. This is how it was. And then this is how it became. And in here, I invented my column, the Hayon column, <laughs> you know, which is like every civilization has a column, you know, the Greeks and I'm <laughs> in my column. Um, and when, when I do interiors, uh, I use the interior as a platform. You know, I think the interior design is a platform to experiment on anything. It's an excuse. Um, the good thing is like things were happening and suddenly me that I come from the south and that I don't come from a school like the Dutch that they go to the school in Eindhoven or the Swiss that go to the school in Le Ecal or the other ones that, so every royal college, you know, all this. No, me, I was in the jungle of Madrid, which is like, design, que es eso? You know, so everyone, like, I was explaining to my parents what design was about, and they were like, ah, oh, he's just like, I don't know, he's just like, I don't know. He's like a fashion designer, I think. <laughs> yeah, he likes that, you know, like, he'll go, like, really cool. And, like, he didn't understand what I was doing at all, actually. I, I had to do a retrospective in a serious museum, where there was even the ambassador and even a representative of the government, you know, <laughs> to get the appreciation of my parents going like, oh, he's doing something serious, actually. Because my mom still bought the chairs anyway in the chunky shop and didn't buy mine, but anyway. So I got into Times Magazine and all this kind of stuff, you know, so I got popular suddenly, and uh, I got commissions to do shops in Tokyo and, uh, you know, Paris and different cities. And I worked with Camper, which is a shoe uh, company, to make their stores for quite a while. And also used the interiors of different ones I did to experiment and try to bring whatever aesthetical meaning to these spaces. And sometimes they were a little bit more crazy, sometimes they were less, you know, less uh, eclectic, whatever. But for me, they were always excuses. And then I discover that interior designers are magicians. They're not designers, <laughs> they're magicians. Because this is me in Paris going to see a restaurant from a client. He goes like, we bought this beautiful restaurant and you're gonna make it beautiful for us, right? And this is where I went. Like, imagine the place. It's like a nightmare. It's like the worst thing on the planet. You know, like, you would, you would fall from the staircase, you know, because it's like, it was like not even a square. It's like, you know. And, and it was so chunky, so terrible. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, you have to be a magician to make this. Or go and, and do a pact with Satan, you know, or something like that to be able to do it. Because I almost died to even think about that this would be precious, you know. But it, <laughs> it was terrible. But then I thought it was so bad that the theme was nice. So this is when the worst gets us the best, yeah? You get inspired from the chunky things. So uh, I went, went back to the office and I said, I'm gonna just clean it up, I'm just gonna paint it. And I'm gonna clean it up and think about a few items there. So I made it pretty elegant. And I, I used a little bit of the things they had, like the cave and the things, and put a new staircase, obviously, so people will not fall. And um, all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I got inspired, they had masks, but then I said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm just gonna make it fake, so they're gonna think that I discover a mask in it, so I put it in, and uh, the clients were asking where the inspiration came from. I said, from the chunky middle-aged shit that we had. And, and this is exactly what I made, but I just refined it, yeah? So that's why I did a mirror that has a chevalier, you know, and um, I mean, imagine you, you show to your client this kind of <laughs> image as inspiration. Yeah, I'm like, I'm gonna make it like the middle age. <laughs> you know? they, they really freaked out with it. But uh, it was very refined, yeah? And it was really nice and still exists and they're really happy and they have two star Michelin and whatever. It's really good. And, uh, and yeah, so this is my latest interior, actually. So I thought today was a good excuse to bring it. It's an hotel I made in Madrid. And this is a bear, zebra bear, that is welcoming you there. But it's a fusion in between what I've learned from Scandinavia, which is beautiful furniture, lovely colors, 
and nice things put together. But at the same time, this sort of comfort, and um, this is what I'm trying to now call, and I put myself on a stamp on it, because this is a new style in Scandinavia. It's called tropical Scandinavian. It's my new style. It's uh, going somewhere else. <laughs> you know? It's just bringing up a chart of color, an expression to the beauty of Scandinavian tradition. Yeah? So I'm using, you know, Fritz Hansen and Tradition and Gooby and all those companies that you guys know really well, but I'm just making them a little bit more shaky, you know, a little bit more like colors, and I put the traditional Spanish ladies on it and all this kind of stuff. So I think that's actually uh, the future for me. It's like, yeah, you go, you know, I've learned a lot from here, but then I'm also bringing my thing here in my way. Um, it's interesting to make interiors because there is something really passionate about the clients that want to really experience something really beautiful in the space. And I really do agree that it's a beautiful platform. So I enjoy myself so much doing this. Also, because there is results, you know, you, you ended up thinking like, oh man, you know, like this is important, for example, to have a new type of light or a new type of chair. So a lot of the products that, like this one, for example, it comes because I needed it, yeah, in the interior. So it's becoming a thinking, you know, if you see, I put this in the restaurant and this is a lamp, you know, the one you see is called Saint Louis because this is where I made it in Paris, in the Saint Louis Island. And in the restaurant I needed, the guy wanted the light to be dimmerized, but also the focus on the plate. How, how do you do that? Yeah. So I, I, I said, yeah, well then we have a ball and then we have a little spot. So this is how this lamp works. And it worked really well, you know, to create the atmosphere. So at the end, all these projects become experiments. They become, um, a platform to learn by doing. They become actually experiences to sort of get deep into a matter and a theme. And these themes bring you to do things that you've probably never done. You know, for me, um, this profession is actually uh, super interesting because you go from one thing to the other. Like suddenly I had to do a skate, for example, with Mini, which is really fun, you know, to do. So you suddenly go into from, from something really big to something really small to something like mechanical. It's very interesting, but at the end, why do you wake up in the morning to do this profession? And for me, there's only a few things that I do know now, because before I didn't know anything. And it's that at the end, I love to have a little bit of a philosophy on me. One thing is that I think exploring tradition, it's interesting to keep it for the next generations. That's why I work with materials that are maybe materials that nobody wants. You know, I work with Baccarat, for example, and I made uh, collections in crystal. So I went to these factories and I learned by doing with the artisans. I play with the work in a free way. Uh, I didn't have total uh, carte blanche, you know, to work on the things, but I did have a relationship of, let's use your beautiful material to bring it to the 21st century in a different way. And, and it made me happy that I could do that with different clients to work with um, traditional materials. This is terracotta. So I worked the guys that do this industry uh, to make some fun vases instead of the little pot, the typical pot. You know, we made beautiful new pots, you know, trying to think about the future of it. Um, it's always, um, you know, it makes it, it makes it very interesting for the everyday, you know, having this sort of cultural side. This is a funny one because this was, uh, I did this for a company, uh, an Italian company. And, and I, I got inspired of Rome, so I call it New Roman. I mean, obviously you can see. And the Romans were so smart, but not so much, because they never put a base in, you know, they always had these amphoras, were round, you know, which is really bizarre. I, I don't understand why they didn't put a base on it, but I thought it was a good inspiration to make a project. So, um, so you know, it's like you take a thing that comes from history and you sort of develop it into something that could have a new meaning, a new aesthetic. And um, I think that's actually what makes it very, very intense. Every day, you're sort of waking up and you're looking around you and you're thinking, you know, an image can be an object, a story can be an object, you know, a theme like that could be an object. This is another crazy story in my life. One uh, Sunday, somebody called me from the Fondation Le Corbusier and told me, I've got a tree from Le Corbusier and I want to give it to you. I'm like, what? Like, I said, like, come on, is that a joke or something? Like, <laughs> like, this was so bizarre. So basically, Le Corbusier planted, this is Le Corbusier, planted a tree in this house uh, called Villa Le Lac for her mom. This is her mom, yeah? This is the tree in this side, and this is the new tree because this one was sick. So they gave it to me. So I got the tree, I chopped the tree. You know, imagine what, <laughs> what a response really did. You get the tree from Le Corbusier, you know, where do I put it? Um, <laughs> it's like, whatever. Like, my wife wanted to kick me out of the house because I said, like, I'm bringing a tree to the house. And I was like, you're going to plant a tree? No, no, it's dry and it's horrible. But it was from Le Corbusier, so 
you know, we can cut it and give it to people. The first thing I thought, we'll do pencils with it and give it to everyone we like. But then uh, we called Faber Castell, you know, in Germany, and they were like, uh, beautiful, sorry, but the, the wood's so bad, we cannot do pencils. And, and so whatever. <laughs> you know? So I said, okay, let's make these things. <laughs> you know? So I thought about who will miss the tree. So the bird will miss the tree. Uh, if you don't have a tree, you don't, cannot put uh, this swivel, this kind of thing for the kids. And, and birdhouses, you know, with a tree, you know. So I made these things. And then I got so inspired then, uh, you know, so that's my bird made of the tree. And this is the swivel thing and, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then with the exercise, I got inspired by Le Corbusier to make a series of accessories like this ones, you know, which are a little bit plain with the architecture. You can see the inspiration very clearly and uh, how the elements uh, ended up. So again, you know, there's a story, there's a consequence, there's a product. This works commercially now, and it's quite nice. It's an accessory, it's a table, and so on. But there's a story behind. And because there's a story behind, it's curious to get it, because it has something else than just the pure function. You know, it became a family of objects that have a certain type of relationship with sculpting. And, you know, there's an origin, which is like Jaime... You know, I, now you know it. You will know, yeah, that's kind of inspired from Le Corbusier stuff. So you, there's a story behind. Same thing than this chair, which is looking at the balconies in Barcelona of Gaudí. I said, let's make something in honor to that because it's beautiful. So I made this plastic chair, which is also in the exhibition. Everything. Working with history, I love it. I think it's like you go to places and you look at things and you're thinking, there's things that we, we just passed through history, but we never came back to it. So I think, you know, I was in Vienna and I, I love Viennese um, architecture, especially the one at the beginning of the century in 1900. Um, so I started to get inspired to make also furniture. So I, I called, um, well, I got together with this company called Wittmann and I started to make things with them with a sort of uh, technique and, um, and way of doing from the old masters in Vienna. So that's why you have this chair that I also have in blue, monochrome. It comes from this sort of construction that Joseph Hoffman used to do. And uh, I, I kind of learned by looking at these pieces and trying to understand what is the assembly, how they're made, what kind of materials they use. And I started to create different pieces that are actually related to this sort of history. So for me, the history, it's very important, but also to learn with techniques, to look at, you know, everybody goes for the 3D stuff and I think we're missing something by not working with people. So for me to mix, for example, the manual with the industrial, I did that when I did the shoes. You know, a shoe is an industrial product, but at the same time, uh, you know, I would have loved to have someone stitching the shoe. I had someone stitching the shoe like a glove, but then I had the sole that was injected, so it was a good relationship in between industrial and traditional. And these kind of things actually bring it to even technology. I mean, I made this phone. Uh, I'm not Apple, <laughs> you know, but this was an interesting thing. Um, I made a clock in the phone, like a real clock. So... Uh, you know, I went back <laughs> you know, to innovate because it's funny, but when you're, you know, before the Apple Watch, yeah, uh, people are actually looking all the time at their clock in the phone and you lose the battery, yeah? So I thought this way you don't lose the battery anymore because you look at the clock, you know, which is there always. And then suddenly you do something like a gentleman, you know, you're, in, you're doing the London thing, you know, you're kind of like looking at you like in your pocket, you know? It's like, so, uh, you know, sometimes you don't need to go too much into technology, yeah? You, sometimes you can go back and look at what, what happened and maybe you get inspired by that, you know? It's like, I made a hole in it. And you know why I make a hole? Because if you go to Asia, everyone loves to hang things on the phones, but there's no hole anymore in the iPhone. Yeah, so they, they, they don't sell anything of, of little pets and stuff that they used to put, which was really kawaii, really beautiful, how they say. And also, I put protection on the sides of the phone so I don't have to wear a condom in my phone yeah? Like you buy the beautiful Apple and they tell you all the shit about the video and all this stuff. And then I said, yeah, put a cover on it. You know? Beautiful design. So I left it just without any condom in it. There you go. No condom. <laughs> anyway, responsibility and um, tradition. It's interesting to me, so sometimes I work with really kitsch companies, such as this one, which is Yadro, which I really appreciate, actually. It's in my hometown. And... Um, they make figurines. So I, th I thought figurines are interesting because they're like a movie, you know? I don't know if you realize, you see a figurine and there's a story happening. It's like a movie, you know? Like there's a, a girl with the flowers and it's doing like that and there's a story there. So I got inspired by this factory and I started to make my own figurines thinking about making my own compositions. And uh, at the end, you know, these, these figurines, they need hair, 
they need shoes, they need furniture, lights. So I thought I'll use my products and I put my shoes on it, you know, and I choose the girls I like, you know, to put them in. So I made these uh, this family portraits and all these kind of things with my products and it actually worked really well. But why did it work really well? Because in reality, if you think about figurines, it's like a 21st century collectible sort of toy, manga, whatever. If you look at it that way, then you go beyond. So I invited very good uh, toy designers from Japan and different places to work with me to sort of make nice figures like this one, which are actually handmade, and they still are working with the artisans in the same way. The only thing, they're not doing classicals. They're not doing these. They're doing that, which is the same, but just with another vision. So suddenly you get the interest of other people, young generations that think, oh, actually, that person handmade is quite cool, you know? And this is the point. This is the actual point of how things could survive, things could be still there, you know, with the techniques and the people, you know? Because it's horrible if suddenly these companies have to close because they don't have new ideas, yeah? Um, exploring the process of how we design, it's another of my important things. Um, we are living in the fast world, and sometimes I believe that we should slow down, that we should just go and think about what we're doing. So sometimes I propose to companies to work hand to hand. I went to a factory and developed a chair without making a drawing, without sending a 3D file, without going there and you know, saying, here's a sketch I see you in the fair. No, I went there, we started to chop the wood, we started to assemble it together, working with the artisans, uh, drinking wine, cutting prosciutto because I was in Italy, and spending some weekend in there, and we started to glue it and put it on together. The hands, the proportion, the ability of being there with all your senses, with your hands, with your eyes, with your smell, with your tiredness sometimes, everything brought it to a very human uh, piece of work. You know, at the end, you start to understand that design is really about relationship and it's about having a good feedback with who do you work. And for me, this is really important today. If I don't have a good partner with me, which is straightforward into the matter of progressing, I don't go anywhere. And it is really important because um, I really enjoy working with people. I enjoy and I feel if you really want to make something good and honest, you really have to work with who do you like and not just go and say, oh, this guy has a brand that is good and I'm going to try it. It's not like that. Um, I sometimes explore new techniques and this brought up commercial success. You have this chair also in the exhibition. It's called... Um, the piña chair, which is the pineapple chair. Yeah? You can see the relationship easily. Uh, and here, for example, I had a lot of problems because the welding was really expensive. So I tried to make this chair um, cheaper by using something that was completely unexpected to me. And this is why I'm saying new techniques brought you to success because suddenly I used these fences, which has a mechanical welding, ended up giving me a price to the chair much lower. You know, suddenly I brought the technique from somewhere else. Same happens with this kind of table that I'm showing you here. This is a really big table. This is a new company. Um, it costed a lot of money to make the mold, almost 100,000 euros, and this guy's starting his company, so this will be a killer, but he really liked the design. So we went to a factory uh, from airplanes, and we took some of the spare parts of the molds to actually do the tables as a result. So this is like kind of being creative to find new solutions to a technical process to go on and try to make something really beautifully done. Um, like this at the end, me, I'm here in Sweden, I'm learning about the things here and I'm getting inspired, but I go everywhere. I go to Japan and learn about Japan and I learn about how they do with food, how they do with things. And I go around the world and why do I go around the world is because I love to see things and get inspired about them. I love to understand that there is theater that is different than in Europe, that food's different, that porcelain can be completely differently done, um, that there is a different type of process in the way things are done. So I never think that we are strong enough to sort of say, I have to settle and stop. No, I think there's always this beginning every time. Every day, there's a new beginning to explore something and to sort of get somewhere with what you're doing. And to me, this has brought me actually to today because it's like I just go from one place to the other and I try things and I see things. You know, I went to Africa, saw this monkey everywhere. <laughs> you know, I came back and I said, we have to make a monkey table. 
you know. And these poor monkeys, they're all like sad, you know, and they're serving everyone. But I said, no, my monkey's like actually thinking if he's going to serve you. Because instead of thinking about it, what's going on with the monkeys? Poor monkeys, poor family, you know. Like he's actually cool, you know, like he's like thinking. And oh, do I serve you? Do I not serve you? And, and the materials were all really crappy. And so I said, let's use 21st century concrete uh, injected molding, <laughs> which, is, which is quite cool. It's like to honor my monkey friends. Yeah? So also, this is a different approach to technology. At the end, everything is inspired on themes, as you can see. This was an exhibition. I get inspired of sports. It's obvious. You can see the golf and the, you know, the bobsleigh thing or the other elements. Like, this is really funny. This, this was called the podium cabinet the podium, you know, one, two, three, and, and it was so fun because this lady came and she said, like, it's beautifully done. It was, like, beautifully done in lacquer and marble. And, and she said to me, great, the best things, my things, I will put them in number one. My husband was number three. Obviously, my son in number two. Beautiful. I was like, okay, I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that. Anyway, but this is how things happen. But you can see straightforward the inspiration. How does it come from and how does he adapt to things? So what I said at the end is like, if you have a theme that inspires you, if you're a professional on these things, you can start to get it and try to look for your own thing. You know, at the end of the day, if you go to the exhibition there, you will see there's a world of Jaime, which I'm trying to express to you uh, today. But at the end, I'm looking for my own fantasy. You know, I have this thing in my head and I draw all the time and I try to apply whatever I think it's right to objects, to sculptures, to experiences, to whatever comes. And at the end, you know, I'm trying to find the invisible man, you know, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I'm trying to find, you know, where to go with the things. I'm trying to experience and try, you know, and I don't have any problem to dare, you know, once in a while. I'm, I'm, I'm like this. And I could do this that you see, which is completely bizarre. But at the same time, it's actually an experiment all the time. You're always learning with the material because you're not giving up. You're not saying, okay, it's there. No, that's, somebody will say, you know, the, the things I heard the most is like, oh, this is too much. This is too crazy. Oh, this is not possible. I love those words, you know, because all of those are actually the opposite. It's like, if you do it like that, then you really make it possible. You know, you got to try, you got to dare, you got to think in a different way. And I think if you do, then everything is possible, yeah? So for me, when I wake up in the morning, I'm always thinking, what's, what's next? What, what shall we do? You know, what shall we think of? What's, what's interesting? And, and, I, and I think for five, ten minutes like that sometimes when I, when I wake up and I just start to get a cup of tea and so on, and I, and I never get a solution of it, you know? I'm thinking like, yeah, I should just go around and look at things and talk to my friends and talk to people and talk to, to uh, you know, and experience uh, life. And then uh, responses will come in different ways, you know. So uh, this is actually what it's, uh, what I call, you know, to be open-minded at the end of the day. You know, trying to go around and have no problems. You know, this, this was my portrait when I started my career. So nobody recognized me as Jaime because I was always dressed up, you know. <laughs> it was quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, but this is the other Jaime, you know, so Jaime can be like this or, or, or like this, you know. <laughs> but they're both the same person. So in my opinion, you have to not worry about who you are. What you have to do is look inside of you and try to understand what is it that you can give, you know, instead of trying to find the next trend. Try to find your own trend, you know, what you have inside of you and how can it expose itself into uh, something interesting, you know. Um, this exhibition happened a long time ago. As you can see, it's structurized, uh, similar to the one I show here. The one I show here, it's more thinking about thematics, and I think it plays really well to what we said today. For me, I'm thinking about the future, and I'm thinking about how ugly the world is looking right now with all the politics and all those trumps and all those terrible things happening. But let's get into the beautiful part and think about this kind of thing. You know, this is me waking up one morning going like, how fucked up the world is, you know? What should I do with it? So then I did the sculpture. I call it the hope bird, you know? Uh, I said it's the hope bird because it's like a bird that stands up and he looks at the horizon. He sort of tried to look at what's happening in the future. So I thought sometimes we can do symbolism. We can do things that are actually provoking a sensation, you know? And I think this is a symbol to me to a positive uh, you know, way of looking at the future. I think if you can stand up and look at the horizon and try to think that things could be better, even though they can look dark, you know, there is a certain type of intensity that comes to you. And 
I, I believe in that. You know, I believe in this idea that human beings can do good things and that we are the creative side of things. And by being creative, you can really create a community of people that are actually welcoming everyone, welcoming every race, everyone, every religion, because it's all about creativity. So I think we are the community of people that could actually save the world a little bit. Huh? So with these last words, I think I will be finishing this thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. So, what do you want to know about me? Um, you're looking really good. Yeah, I am. I like the matching of your socks. Thank you. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I tried it out in front of the mirror this morning. Mm -mm. Very I'm, stylish presenter. Yeah. My name is Mark. Hi, Mark. How you doing? Um, I write about architecture. All right. And design. And I've been moderating at the fair for Donkey's years, it's been uh, I don't know for how long. Anyway. Anyway. I'm a sad man because I've got no sea where I live at all. I live in Gamla Enskede in Stockholm. All right. I've got no sun because I live here. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, I'm a, I'm not a particularly Jaime Hayon type of man. Mm -mm. Anyway. Um, things I wrote down while listening to you, that you pick up the phone. Yeah. And they say, yes. <laughs> well, it was not always like that. But, uh, and it still is not like that. Um, well, I got more and more people interested to work with me, but um, I, I'm, I'm a no person. You know, I'm kind of like, I, I need to have a good relationship with the, with the people. So mainly what happens is that if I really meet the person, and, you know, I, I don't go and, and, and kind of wait for somebody to call me and, and said, hey, you know, we need this thing. You know, I'm kind of like going around and I meet people and these guys happen to have a company and then we have a good time and whatever. I don't, I don't believe that. I promise. Yeah? Yeah. Mostly it happened in, uh, in an accidental way. It doesn't happen really like, but I hardly actually propose things, you know, to, um, to companies. No, it doesn't work like that in me. No, it didn't. Not in this way. It was like totally, actually the beginning, it was like because one, one editor came to one of my exhibitions and he was interested about it and we started to talk about it and then the first product came out. And you know, like that has been, you know, that other guy saw what I did and he was interested and he asked me, obviously, but it was a human thing. I don't, sometimes they write me an email and I look at it and yes. if, I, if I love the company, I, I might react to it, obviously. Yeah. But in general, I like to meet the people behind because he can look amazingly well, but what if you don't like the person when you are there, you know? My, I get so involved, you know, in the process of making things. Because, you know, I went through the presentation, but um, I could stay an hour talking of one product, you know, how it's made. And, you know, some of the sofas took me three years to make them, you know, like process and, and going to Denmark and <laughs> meeting these guys forever. And Yeah, that's, and, you a, know, that's an, a really odd combination, yeah. I feel like. Jaime Ayon, Fritz Hansen. It's, yeah. uh, I don't know what would be a, a good analogy. Ricky Gervais serving the English Queen or something. Exactly. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, but now it's like... Uh, no, but it's such a... Did yeah. they call you or did you call them? No, no, no. I didn't call them. No, they called me, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a little bit of a bizarre first beginning because <laughs> it was a big. friend of mine. Well, someone had a vision there that said, maybe this guy can really make something for us, you know, in a different way. Um, and it obviously, it was not the obvious choice, yeah, as you can... You're saying... Um, but it worked really well because I understood them, you know? I think, I think something I, I, I've been analyzing a lot of, you know, when I see the work I've done, is that I've understood the people I had in front, no matter if they were doing porcelain or they were doing upholstery or they were doing, you know, I, I, I went and, and I was open. You know, I didn't just impose myself. I was like really open to listen and, and do, yeah? Which is different position when you get to a place, you know, you're, you're kind of like looking at what they're doing and understanding it and then, then you act. Hmm. Yeah. So you've got big ears. Super big ears. No. <laughs> Medium. <laughs> You're living in Valencia. Mm -hmm. You're born in Madrid. Exactly. Was that a, a, a conscious choice to place yourself outside of the capital city? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it was even worse than that because I left Madrid and I went to Italy for seven years. Mm -hmm. To Benetton? I, well, I worked in uh, this research center called Fabrica, which was actually 
uh, sponsored by Benetton, but it was not Benetton. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to be correct on that. So I was seven years there, and, uh, and then I went to Barcelona. Um, then I went to London, and then from London, I moved to Valencia, because I was tired of the um, rain. <laughs> so I needed sun and Mediterranean. And, to be happy. And Valencia is a little bit like Napoli, you know? so a little, little bit crazy. It's not so perfectly organized, and I love the disorder to get into concepts and ideas. You know, it's quite, quite nice, you know, it's vibrating, you know? It's not, there's always something happening to you, yeah. <laughs> you know? The fact, that you, the fact that you pick the second largest city and not the capital, is that, yeah. I'm thinking that maybe that illustrates what I think I see in your work, that you, you really try to place yourself on the outside, outside yeah. looking in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, that's so important because like, um, well, actually, uh, Valencia is like the, the third city of uh, Spain, to be correct, and this Barcelona before. Um, but then I don't even live in Valencia itself. I live in a village glued to Valencia. So I live in between oranges and, and nobody knows about trendiness. I mean, I'm, I'm the coolest guy in the, in the village, man. Like <laughs> well, I bet you are. I think you, know? you look pretty cool. But definitely. <laughs> and, and, and I go to the bar in the morning, which is like super cheap, and I get tomatoes and, and olive oil, and I start to sketch. And, and, and sometimes they call me, and I'm starting to be, you know, they, they, they thought I was a foreigner because they're going like, man, he's like, he doesn't, you know, and they start to speak Spanish behind me because like, oh, he's like a foreigner. You bought a house here. <laughs> and, like, and I'm like, and then I'm speaking to them, and they're all freaking out like... You, know, you make it sound also uh, haphazard, you know. You make it sound as if it's, yeah, I go down to the bar in the morning. But it is like that. And olive oil it and start like sketching. And, I mean, it and is. now you're here. And, uh, yeah, well, this is just, exactly yeah. my life. You know, tomorrow I'll be again in the bar yeah. and again in the countryside. And I don't, you know, you can sleep, you know, you can talk to the donkey if you want. But it's like, there's nobody with like, uh, you know, you know the, nobody has a hay chair or like, you, no, know, no. you know. They don't even know no. what fruit sensing is. No. Like, uh, they don't, nobody knows. That's too intellectual, where are you going, you know? <laughs> yeah, but absolutely, I mean, that's crazy. I, I try to explain to these people what I do, it's impossible. I live, I live in a village, yeah. you know, in a small village, and, and the people are, sometimes they're knocking on the door, and they're asking me if I want to go to the parade, you know, to take the Christ out of the church, and I'm like, no, no, I'm all right. You know, this kind of stuff. Because you I mean, know seriously, it's like, tong, 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 tong. Uh, you open the door, hi, they want to come? No, we have the cows and the things, we're going to the... To the church, you come in. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. And, and, and then, then please explain to us why do you choose to live there so far from the trends, from the action, the marketing surveys, the whole big business of furniture design and, and architecture. Is that, is that the reason you want to just stay well, away? I, I, from I have that? a big house. Yeah. I eat really well, mm. uh, healthy. Mm. Um, I buy the tomatoes from the people that make the tomatoes there. So yeah, and the olive oil. And the mm. olive oil and the wine and everything. They, they have a little a stall market from everyone that has mm. things because we live in between vegetables and, and oranges and all <laughs> kinds of stuff. Um, but it's really interesting because, of, co of course, I travel and I see a lot of things and then I digest these things when I'm home. You, know, you must have a punishing uh, traveling schedule, don't you? You I, must I, be out traveling. I travel about um, maximum of 10 days a month, maximum. Um, but I really enjoy, you know, I really enjoy the, the, um, the sort of natural way of living, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of, it's a good contrast. If I, you know what happened to me when I lived in London, it's like I thought the trip never end. You know, I went to Tokyo, I come back to London, it's still active and mm. very hectic, yeah? Mm. You come from Stockholm, you go, you go to London, again, the trip is continuing, yeah? So again, there's going to be an opening somewhere, or but there is like an opening of what? You know, maybe somebody will... Well, like, well, they invite you to do things, but you know, like, like other things. You know? But I can go to Madrid, which is much more trendy. Yeah, it's not too far. But <laughs> does it mean that you feel like an like an outsider? Well, I am, and I'm not. You know, like people write about you in in, uh, in newspapers, magazines, and stuff that are very active. Mm. And uh, well, once in a while, somebody of the village sees it, and they go like, "Shit, man, he's like famous." <laughs> Yeah, because I had that. And I, I even had one that told me for about three weeks in a row, imagine, three weeks, going like, you look like a guy that is like actually quite famous. He was in a magazine, man. You really do. But he never associated me that it was me. And I went three weeks because to the same place. Because it was just so improbable. <laughs> no, that it was famous impossible. Guy was to live impossible. There. Impossible, I would live there. <laughs> so he was like, like I gotta come. And I, I even went, uh, I had breakfast in that same bar with Jasper Morrison, and other designers because they went, they came to visit. 
And obviously, they don't know anything. <laughs> you know? Uh, what does a guy like Jasper Morrison think of your stuff? He likes it, actually. Yeah. He doesn't think it's too... Uh, no. Baroque? No, it's not, it's not Baroque, actually, at all. <laughs> like, that's a bad word. Um, no, it's not. It's not Baroque. It's actually pretty sophisticated. So I think he shares a lot of the, you know, volumes. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of works. He, yeah. he gets near to it, you know? And even some crazy works he likes a lot. But that's, you know, something you like doesn't mean you're going you're gonna to make it, you know? And maybe he likes the opposite that he's making mm. a little bit sometimes, mm. you know? Yeah. But I think we're not so opposed, actually. I think uh, we're more near than people think, you know? And what are the similarities, would you say? Well, there's a lot of proportions, a lot of material interest, a lot of construction interest. Yes. You know, we speak about how things are done. Mm. You know, we like, we share thoughts on... And we like a lot of agricultural things mm. together. Mm. He does wine, you know, so he likes That's to come right. into my That's area. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, we're, we're friends, you know, and friends to other colleagues as well mm. that are, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, we're all sharing the same sort of interest on, on trying to find a progression with the industry anyway and with how things are done. And, you know, there's an interesting um, community of people that are big thinkers on, on how to make stuff and how to make it relevant and, you know, all the companies, I mean, he works for Vitra and I, I work with Fritz Hansen. They're both companies that are very solid, very serious, very standard on, yes. on the focus. And, you know, there's, it's good to have chats about yeah. where things go and how they can manifest in the future, I think. Mm. Yeah. I want to ask you about how much of an artist you are or how much of a designer you are. <laughs> um, but if I put the question this way instead, is it, what's the easiest, to have a very strict brief Mm -hmm. Or to have no brief at all? You know, like, I think a brief is quite important for creativity because it, it sort of narrows the, the direction. Um, I mean, one thing is a brief, one thing is the expectations, I would say, you know? I like to talk more about what you expect from things with whoever is commissioning me something. It's like, what would you, what would you, where do you see yourself with this, with this collaboration? I mean... Do you, do, you, do you think we should do a switch on, on your identity because of what I'm going to make with you? Or, or no, you want something that is more respecting your, your identity right now? And, you know, I, I, I have conversations that are beyond the brief. So I think to me, you need that sort of conversation, which is actually a conversational brief, <laughs> you know, yeah. to get somewhere. And, um, and without that somewhere, you know, you sort of maybe get lost, and, which is not good. You know, so I think, I think to have a little bit of a narrow conversation, so a little bit of a brief, huh? mm -hmm. it's kind of better than to have something free. Mm -hmm. um, that has nothing to do with, with, uh, with uh, either art or design. You know, I think uh, for me, it's just that I've worked with museums and galleries, and I work with furniture and interiors. So there are two worlds, you know, and sometimes they unite, because if I do an hotel, I can put a sculpture, and if I do the opposite, I can put some furniture. It's like, you know, it, it works together. But I do functional and non-functional work. Mm. You know, sculpting and making installations is very different than, than creating chairs and sofas, you mm. know. But do they feed off each other? Um, form does, and uh, materials do, proportions do. You know, a lot of things can come back and experiments. You know, the, the platform of art is really open, and uh, the galleries I work with, they want something that it's, that it's also according to my aesthetics. So, um, you know, there is a, there is a relationship, mm. you know. Le Corbusier, he was, a, he was an artist and he was a designer and he was an architect. And like, why, why, you know, why, what's new about mm -hmm. what I'm doing? It's, it's there since he's I years. Think, you know? I, th I thought it was so nice to see that, I mean, to most of us, Corbusier is this very strict, modernistic architect. Mm. But you did not go for the UN headquarters building when you were inspired by him. You went for Ronchamp uh, yeah. instead. But or? I think that's what he, that's what, that's what he was, yeah. really. He was much more of an artist and... Much more, you know, like I love this, you know, he ended up in a cabana, you know, he was painting naked in the mornings, you know, he was like completely nuts, you know. Yeah, exactly. So at the end of the day, um, he had his own aesthetic, right? And his own way of, but a lot of uh, interesting people had had their own aesthetic. If you, if you think about, you know, uh, Alvar Alto or you think about, you know, Arne Jacobsen or whatever uh, architect designers, they've had more than just one discipline. They were yes. getting more broad, you know, because yes. they, they had a philosophy. Mm. And that's the point, mm. is to have a philosophy with you, yeah? Mm. Uh, are you typically Spanish in your, your design language? I mean, you uh, mentioned Dali, you <laughs> mentioned Gaudí. I, I like those references. Um, well, I do have the Spanish vibe, you know? Mm. Like, uh, that's for sure. Um, 
I think, I think you know, today it's really hard to have an own na nation identity mm. because we're so broad, you know, yes. we go everywhere. And so everything influences you, so you have an international vision. But, um, but obviously in the sense of color, in the, you know, it's different to be all day with the sun, all day with, uh, you know, it's different. You, the, the colors are, the perception is it's very, very different than if you're, if you're in the north, you know, everything's more settled, you know, it's... But things are changing, you know? Mm. Things are changing, things are getting fusion. There's, uh, there's this uh, thing, cycle. You know, something is happening there, so... What is, what is that cycle, do you mean? <laughs> well, I, I mean that, that, you know, like, you're having more and more relationships in between countries, okay. and the creatives are... You know, you have a lot of Japanese um, beautiful ceramics that are inspired now in Europe and, uh, and the techniques that we have in Europe, but then they're processed by Japanese. So, they, so there's a new style happening. Same happened with the clothing, for example. You have, now clothing is not anymore from Milan. You know, it happens that here you have a huge industry and suddenly like, you know, it's almost like, it's almost tacky to dress like a Milanese, you know, <laughs> you know because the, the people here have a certain type of, you know, Beautiful chart of color, and the companies have created like you know have, you have the Acnes and the, all these companies, the yes. cost, and you know they have created something really unique as well. So suddenly, where does that come from? You know, and I think it comes from globalism. You know, it comes from this idea of globalization, this idea of bringing up styles, putting them together, influences, and and that brings a, a, a very interesting world. You know, aside is. It's like today you can go anywhere and eat ceviche, which is completely Peruvian, and in any place in, you know, <laughs> far away from Peru, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, and before it was impossible. It could, be, it could also result in the opposite, I imagine, that yeah. the, the whole world is neutralized and it's, there's no characteristic... Uh, exactly. Well, that's, uh, that's actually what's... Um, that has happened, but um, this is called the mirror effect. You know, it's like everything looks similar. But on the other hand... Um, it brings people to work with more with their hands and the effect and the little uh, traditions which are local. Mm. So there is this local and global thing happening big time, mm. you know. How old are you? I'm 42. Um, Looks very good, right? <laughs> Looks very good for your age, I must Thank say. Thank you very much. Well, today I'm a little bit tired to see you. <laughs> Distinguished and young at the same time. Um, I was thinking that this, there's a, there's a certain amount of naivety in your work. There's this uh, um, seeking, uh, not being afraid of, of expressions that other designers would shed, really. Okay. Um, how, how, do you, how are you able to keep that curiosity, that naivety okay. alive? Hmm. I think I, I was always really curious. I'm always observing all the time. Um, Probably because I don't sit down, you know, when I, when I achieve a certain level, I'm sort of like, okay, that's great, but let's do it different now. <laughs> you know? So I pose that problem all the time. I never sit down comfortably. It's like, um, you know, I'm aware of the success of the work. Great, thank you, but I want to keep going. You know, I want to I keep natural and, and have a good time. You know, I don't have time. Imagine how much time people waste because they're popular doing something like well, the bullshit, right? I don't want the bullshit. I want the right thing, <laughs> you know, walking around, doing the things like everyone and enjoying. So I never sit down comfortably. I never go, oh, I'm success. I do nothing. Just get paid. Yeah. No, 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 no. That would be the end. You know, you got to start from the beginning again and try to understand what the students are doing, you know, what the newcomers are doing. You know, it's nice to see. You know, it's nice to give an opportunity to this guy or the other. You know, it's, mm. I'm open like that. How you do know? you keep track of what's going on? I'm curious. I just go and see things, you know. Do you read a lot? Do you, do you subscribe I, to a lot of magazines? No, or? no, no. Uh. That's like, actually, you, you will never be. You will never be. <laughs> do you go to a lot of furniture if, if fans? I do, but I, I hardly see them, no. actually, because I'm doing things yeah. or I'm doing interviews or whatever. But, uh, no, it's more me. Um, I mean, obviously, so once in a while, I teach in the university or I meet people mm -hmm. that I like. I'm, I'm, you know, I try to, to be open and not to, to go to s just the big things. I also like to go and see, you know, the like, little stands that are starting, you know, doing their stuff. And, because I started like that as well. Mm -hmm. Nobody gave me these. Nobody put me just there. You know, I started to, you know, I, I worked in a restaurant for many years <laughs> and, and tried to, to be a finance, designer. To finance your art. Well, it was really hard, you know. Yeah. So... Um, you know, I think it's, it's very interesting to, 
to sort of you know meet people and and and, and not 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 to get wasted with uh, with all these other crap things you know trying no. to get in, into concentration and learn you know that this is how I keep it good you know trying to go back again and trying to understand you know where can we go further I think it's really important for me yeah. I'm thinking of something that uh, Picasso, I think, said, another great Spaniard, mm -hmm. um, that he spent his whole life trying to paint like a child, right? Practicing oh, every that. day to yeah. paint like a child. That's good. That's a good Isn't sentence. It? Yeah. Yeah, they can do it perfectly. Now, I have my sons, um, they help me drawing. Because when I'm tired of drawing, I just give them things and they draw <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> so, that's a different thing. So your sons are actually the makers of some of these projects. <laughs> well, not the, not the bad <laughs> one. Actually, they made some good ones. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see the kids' um, reaction. Yeah, and, and there's a little bit of naivety in this case. You know, when I approach a project, it's, yeah, sometimes I'm like a little bit like a child, actually, mm. at the end, mm. myself. Yeah. I, I just don't have any problem to mistake. <laughs> If you were to describe your work, how would you describe it for well, someone who's never seen it before? I would say that it's, um, you know, that it has a lot of quality in general in terms of detail. You know, I like details and things. And, um, you know, I think it's, well, it, it just talks to you in a way, you know, it's like um, you can like it or not, but you're not just passing by like that. I would say like that, you know, you just like stop. And you say, oof. <laughs> or, mm. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. The important thing is like it gives you something that yeah. it's uh, to keep. You know, that's just, I think that I would describe it like that. And with this sentence, maybe I invite people to see it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the curiosity is that. Curiosity, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're run, running out of time. So, could you uh, could you sing for us? Oh no, not today. My voice is terrible today. Oh, it sounds good. I promise it? you, I will His do voice it another sounds time. Good? No, no, no. Look at that. Uh, uh, no, 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 I'm not going to sing. Some, just something, flamenco. No, 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 no. No. <laughs> no, sorry about that. I'm not going to sing. He's going to sing, you know. He's going to sing I because look at him. He's, he's beautifully I'm not dressed. Going to sing. You know, not me, not me. You know, like, uh, you know, you can sing Frère Jacques <laughs> if you want. <laughs> it's easier. No, 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 I'm not going to sing today. I'm, I'm, no, today I'm, I'm kind of chill out. Okay. You know? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, that's too much to ask, I okay. think, you know. Thank you for coming. It's and thanks a pleasure. for, um, for being pleasure. the guest of honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs>